Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining our town hall on presidential incapacity and the Constitution. For those of you who do not know me, I am Dr. Bandy Lee, forensic psychiatrist, violence expert, and president of the World Mental Health Coalition. My co-hosts today are Leonard and Mark. Please be advised that this session is being recorded. One of the goals of this town hall series has been to make expertise accessible to the public. Experts have a responsibility to society as well as to their clients and themselves, but even as those with power and money are able to ac ac access and make use of ever greater expertise, public forums for sharing specialized knowledge are ever shrinking as news programs call upon pundits rather than experts, and discourse becomes entertainment rather than issue-oriented. Today we will discuss a quandary that we've been facing. Mental health experts had a consensus at the start of this presidency that the president was mentally incapacitated and dangerous. As more and more data became available, we came to have certainty when we had solid first-hand reports under sworn testimony, the best kind of information you can have for capacity evaluation, we did a complete standardized test and discovered that the president failed every criterion for even basic mental capacity. This means he would not be fit for any job, let alone president. The evidence is so abundant, our report would be admissible in any legal court. So then what is wrong with our constitution? How is it possible that a totally incapacitated president is allowed to continue, not just for the full term of presidency, but to be a candidate for re-election? How is this acceptable? After a quarter million deaths, a vast majority for which he is responsible, exactly as our mental capacity evaluation predicted? How is he allowed to abrogate multiple nuclear treaties and change policies so as to bring us ever closer to nuclear war in the context of worsening geopolitical conflicts and alienating our allies? How can he be permitted to put our constitutional republic itself in danger through his disordered authoritarian impulses and sociopathic tendencies? As mental health professionals, we cannot say how a president is to be re removed for the sake of public health and safety. But we can say that he must be removed. Our quandary is as to why he is not. And it is for this purpose that we are holding this town hall. So first, we will hear from Representative Jamie Raskin of Maryland, who is also a constitutional scholar and former law professor. He spoke to us on the 25th Amendment a year and a half ago at the National Press Club. But his new legislation introduced just last month is a repeat of the legislation he will describe here. And so it's very current. Since this is an academic and not a political meeting, we decided not to invite him, but to hear his words for our discussion. So this will last approximately 15 minutes. Leonard, would you show us the video? Hello, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to come by to say a few words about the 25th Amendment. Um, so my subject is uh, related, but slightly different from what everybody else is talking about. Um, the, um, I actually wanted to start by just invoking the memory of a great American that we lost uh, last Thursday, um, the late Senator Birch Bayh, uh, who died on March 14th. He was uh, the lead sponsor, introducer, and author of the 25th Amendment to the Constitution, as well as the 26th Amendment to the Constitution, which uh, lowered the voting age in federal elections to age 18. And he also was the author of, uh, of Title IX and uh, was involved with uh, 
me and some other legislators in uh, promoting the National Popular Vote Plan, which is an attempt to get America out of the uh, antiquated and obsolete electoral college system as we have it, which has delivered um, two popular vote losers in the last five elections as President of the United States, both in uh, 2000 and, uh, of course, um, in um, 2016. Um, but um, so Senator Bai, who we lost last week, um, was uh, the great champion of the 25th Amendment, which was added to the Constitution in 1967. He worked closely with Senator Robert F. Kennedy, uh, who uh, helped him in moving the 25th Amendment. But it was a, a strong uh, bipartisan effort, and it passed overwhelmingly in the House and the Senate with both Democratic and Republican support. The 25th Amendment has uh, four parts to it, and the first three have all been activated and used. The first one simply says that uh, if the presidency is vacant because the president uh, is um, removed from office, if he's impeached and convicted, or if he dies, or if he resigns, uh, the vice president becomes president, which actually was uh, a bit ambiguous before that. It was clear that the vice president would uh, employ the powers of the presidency, but it wasn't exactly clear whether or not the vice president would become the president. And so section one established that the vice president actually becomes the president. Um, section two dealt with a vacancy in the vice presidency. If the vice president leaves, the president nominates a vice president, and with uh, majority approval in the House and Senate, it, Senate, that nominee then goes on to become the vice president of the United States. Think about uh, Richard Nixon uh, nominating Gerald Ford after the resignation of Spiro Agnew. Um, so um, that's section two, and that has been used. Um, and then section three um, deals with the temporary transfer of power from the president to the vice president um, in the event that the president is unable to successfully discharge the powers and duties of office. And I think of this one as the, the colonoscopy provision of the 25th Amendment because it's been used for a number, uh, in a number of cases of the uh, presidential colonoscopy, also during President Reagan's colon surgery uh, when Vice President Bush took over. Um, and then Bush uh, had a colonoscopy and uh, transferred the powers to Cheney for the, the period until he recovered consciousness and then uh, under the terms of the amendment uh, is able to resume the powers of the presidency just by writing a letter. Okay, so when people talk about the 25th Amendment today, what they're talking about is section four of the 25th Amendment, which has not been used yet. And what it says is that when uh, the vice president and a majority of the cabinet or the vice president and a majority of a body set up by Congress determine that uh, the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of office, then the vice president shall immediately assume the powers and duties of office in the place of the president. Now, it's not the end of the story because the president can then, um, I mean, think of a case where it's, everything is cooperative and um, agreeable, a case where, say, a president uh, loses consciousness and is in a coma, um, and the vice president and a majority of the cabinet or the vice president and a majority of a body set up by Congress say the president cannot uh, successfully pursue the powers and duties of office, and then the president's in a coma, say, for two weeks, and then snaps out of it, comes back. At that point, the president can transmit a letter to the president pro tem of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, and say, I'm back, everything's fine, and everything's good. Now, in the case where, um, say, a president is um, otherwise waylaid, the president is kidnapped, the president goes missing, or the president has some kind of uh, psychotic break or mental breakdown. You could have the same sequence of events and say the president insists upon his capacity, but the vice president and a majority of this body set up by Congress or a majority of the cabinet disagree. At that point, they've got four days to come together and say, we disagree with the letter that's sent by the president. And at that point, power is restored to the vice president, and then Congress has to meet 
and Congress gets together and within 21 days has to decide in the event that there's a contest over whether or not the president has the power to execute the uh, to successfully execute the duties of office, um, the Congress has to decide. And it's by a two-thirds vote. In other words, it would require a two-thirds vote to remove the powers from the president and keep the vice president um, acting. If the Congress does not decide by a two-thirds vote in both houses, a concurrent vote, um, that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of office, then he resumes. Okay, so you can see that that's a, it's a fairly intricate system filled with a lot of protections. Um, the authors of the 25th Amendment did not want this to be some kind of uh, political process, much less a partisan process. They didn't want it to be uh, a substitute for impeachment, and it's more difficult than impeachment in the final analysis because impeachment, of course, requires just a majority vote in the House of Representatives and a two-thirds vote to convict in the Senate. This would, in the final analysis, require a two-thirds vote in both houses of Congress. So it's not like this is any kind of uh, shortcut or end run around the impeachment process, which, of course, deals with a different question constitutionally, Impeachment deals with the question of whether there are high crimes and misdemeanors, offenses against uh, the republic uh, for which the president must be removed. Um, and there, the, the language is bribery, treason, or other high crimes and misdemeanors to give you a sense of what the founders had in mind in terms of the kinds of offenses against the republic that justify impeachment. This was a very different problem. And if you look at it in the context of sections one, two, and three, it's about um, a, a real problem of succession that takes place in the presidency in the nuclear age. Because this is passed in 1967, after the assassination of uh, President Kennedy, which was much on the minds of the authors of this, and it's very much part of the legislative history. And a lot of it is about who will have control over nuclear weapons. And we can't afford to have ambiguity and looseness in this process. We need to have clarity about who is in control of the executive branch of government. Um, in uh, my first term in Congress, in the last term, uh, I introduced legislation to set up the body that has never been created for Congress um, to have in the event of a presidential emergency. When I first got elected, uh, I was searching for it. I couldn't find it. I called over to the Library of Congress. I said, where is the body that was set up by Congress? And they called back and they said, the body was never set up by Congress. And that was on the 50th anniversary of the 25th Amendment and of Section 4. The body simply was never set up. Now, you could read it to suggest that the body should only be set up in the midst of an emergency. Obviously, that's not ideal because then it, you know, it slows everything down and becomes uh, a part of the controversy. Um, I think it's better uh, read to be a permanent body that Congress sets up that will act alongside the cabinet in the event of a presidential incapacity. So um, we had 65 co-sponsors. Uh, unfortunately, it was all along party lines. It was all Democrats who co-sponsored. But the legislation doesn't mention um, the current president. It doesn't mention any president. It just sets up the body so that it is there to act in the event of a crisis or an emergency. Um, I'm going to be reintroducing this uh, legislation within a week or two. Uh, I hope that we get a lot more than 65 or 70 co-sponsors that we ended up with uh, from the last Congress. I hope we get an overwhelming bipartisan uh, mandate for us to do this. And um, I think that the, the logic of it is compelling. For one thing, we are still very much in uh, the nuclear age, obviously. And, you know, we have had uh, mad kings and deranged executives for many centuries in history. There's an interesting literature I found about the intersection of uh, sociopathy and political leadership, and there's no doubt that sociopaths are often attracted to high office and to political power. But the nuclear age obviously dramatically changes the stakes of what it means to allow someone uh, who is mentally imbalanced 
to uh, reach the highest levels of government in uh, any country in the world. And so I think that uh, Senator Bayh and um, the Congress in 1967 in the states that adopted the 25th Amendment were very wise and prescient um, in their thinking about this. And I think that we've got to vindicate the wisdom of what they did. There's a, an important separation of powers point that also needs to be made. And I think that it is one that is um, illustrated vividly by current events. Um, the 25th Amendment says that the cabinet can act, but the cabinet is obviously in the executive branch of government underneath the thumb of the president. And the framers of the 25th Amendment understood that the cabinet could be cowed or manipulated or intimidated or threatened by the president, especially a president who, for various reasons, is not successfully able to discharge the powers and duties of office. And so that's why the framers said, we're going to have two bodies that can act in conjunction with the vice president. One would be the cabinet, and the other is a body set up by Congress for this purpose. In the legislation that I will be uh, reintroducing with my colleagues, we are calling for a 17-member commission that would be made up of eight members who are former um, members of the executive branch of government, former presidents, vice presidents, attorneys general, secretaries of defense, secretary of uh, treasury, surgeon general of the United States, and a few other offices, um, eight of whom would be uh, physicians uh, and psychiatrists, um, and then one, a 17th member, who would be a chair chosen by all of the members of the commission. All of these people would be appointed on a scrupulously bicameral and bipartisan uh, process. So there would be uh, the Democratic and the Republican leaders of the Senate and the House who would be responsible for appointing within these various categories. Um, so, but we, we need it because I think we've already seen the way in which members of the executive branch who have been talking about the 25th Amendment have come under all kinds of intense reprisal and scrutiny. Uh, just, uh, it was either this morning or yesterday, I saw an article about, about Senator Lindsey Graham who wants to do an investigation of uh, members of the executive branch in the Department of Justice who talked about the 25th Amendment in the case of the current president. In other words, they want to make it somehow suspicious activity to talk about the 25th Amendment. The whole point of the 25th Amendment is to have members of the cabinet um, engage in the process of making sure that the president is able to discharge the powers and duties of office. But as each um, returnee from the Trump administration comes back to talk about what's taking place inside, uh, they are all invoking the 25th Amendment. And they say there's lots of talk about the 25th Amendment in different circles. And you can go to each one of the books that's been written. And um, unfortunately, I read most of them. Um, and uh, most of them have people talking about the 25th Amendment. I think what provoked the ire of Senator Graham was uh, the suggestion that um, that Rod Rosenstein had talked about uh, the 25th Amendment and people in the Department of Justice. Well, if you're going to have a crackdown on speech about the 25th Amendment, almost as if it's like talking about climate change, something else you're not allowed to talk about, um, obviously it's not going to work to have the cabinet be the watchdog for the national security when it comes to our 25th Amendment interest. And that's why Congress really does need to set up another body so that it's there and we can break the glass in the event of an emergency. So um, I, I know I've done nothing to uh, illuminate your central subject here today, but at least I wanted to give you some background on the constitutional architecture dealing with this problem and say that there are some people in Congress who are working on this problem and we will be pushing legislation in this Congress. So thanks for inviting me to drop by. Sir. Bandy, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry about that. Our next speaker will be attorney Richard Painter. 
former Chief Ethics Counsel to the Bush-Cheney Administration, professor at the University of Minnesota Law School, founding board member of Take Back Our Republic, and former chair of CREW, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. He is joining us by phone from the hospital because of a family medical situation, and we're very grateful to have him. Richard, would you like to go ahead? Richard? Um, Leonard, do we have a 617 number here? I'm looking. Um, he should be able to unmute himself. So Richard, if you are here, please unmute yourself. Uh, for my initial scan, I do not see a 617 dial-in number. OK, so uh, we wanted to prepare for possible emergencies. So, uh, so why don't we go to the recording? So this again is from the National Press Club Conference where he uh, spoke to us um, a year and a half ago and the issue of course is still relevant. Thank you. I'm Richard Painter. I'm a member of the New York Bar, but I am uh, teaching at the University of Minnesota. I'm also a scared American. I'm scared for my family. I'll mention three family members that come to mind. One, my grandfather, who's long since passed, Sidney Homer Jr., who was a bond market economist and bond dealer in New York in the 1930s and 40s and who uh, was very concerned about what was going on in Germany. And uh, he, he went around raising the alarm when many people in New York were busy stuffing their pockets on business deals in Germany, uh, figuring out how much money they could make investing in companies over there. And then when Hitler took over, focusing only on protecting their investments. Uh, how can we make sure and recover on our bonds? Uh, that's what's important. No, my grandfather was scared, scared for the future of our country. And then Europe went to war, and my grandfather was urging that the United States come in on the side of Great Britain, and a group called America First said no. A group that was bankrolled, much of the money coming from powerful business interests who had investments in Germany, and didn't want the United States to get involved in that war. And we should have learned our lesson from what happened then. Even the New York Times, the greatest newspaper in America then, and I think still today, failed miserably to cover what was going on in Germany in the 30s on into the 40s throughout the war. People weren't willing to stand up and say what they thought. There is a duty, a duty to warn, a duty to protect, not just a duty to focus on your own economic interests. And I'm glad my grandfather did that. He didn't make money on Wall Street, but he stood up for his country. I think of my wife as a music historian, Karen Painter, and uh, she does a lot of work on what happened in Germany in the 30s and uh, the 40s. And uh, a Trump speech comes on. Uh, and she's sitting there at her computer and takes a look at it. And she's scared, and I'm scared. I know those analogies some people say are too well-worn and that we, we shouldn't try to draw comparisons between what Donald Trump is saying and what a dictator could do without the protections that we have built into our Constitution. But it is a very dangerous situation, particularly if we do not use the protections that are built into our Constitution in the 25th Amendment of the Constitution and the impeachment clause in the Constitution. We have an obligation, a duty to warn, a duty to protect. And I think of my three children and the fact that this president could obliterate human civilization kill me, my wife, my children, my friends, everyone in this room in 20 minutes because he has control of the weaponry to do that. And it is for that reason that we have the 25th Amendment of the Constitution. 
that was adopted in the 1960s to respond to the grave threat to our country if a psychologically imbalanced individual who was incapable of serving as President of the United States were to be in the White House and in control of nuclear weapons. There's a duty to warn, a duty to protect. And the psychiatrists and the psychologists who have the courage to step forward and say what they think are protecting our country and human civilization. And never should you allow your profession to tell you you need to keep your mouth shut. How many people were told to keep their mouth shut in Germany in the 1930s? And where did they end up? Where did our civilization end up? Your profession should never be able to tell you not to speak your mind. We need psychiatrists, we need psychologists to say what they think and take that Goldwater rule and throw it away. It is a violation of your First Amendment rights and a violation of your duty to your country and to human civilization. Say what you think. We need you. I can't go on CNN and speak as an expert on the mental health of the President of the United States. I can look at his Twitter feed and say, hey, he looks like he's nuts. But that's about all I can do. And that I'm scared, and I'm scared for my children, my family, and for all of you. But I need your help. You need a lot less of me on CNN and MSNBC, and a lot more of you if you are a mental health professional. And I want to see you there. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't speak out. It's your duty. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll see if Richard is here. Richard, have you joined us yet? OK, well, uh, we'll wait till he does, if he can. Um, those of you who. Uh, do not know about our National Press Club conference. We held a major interdisciplinary conference uh, at the National Press Club that uh, was fully broadcast on C-SPAN for the three hours where we had an unprecedented meeting of 13 top experts of all different fields from around the country gather in one place to speak about uh, how the president was unfit from each of their perspectives. This was March of 2019. And in April of 2019, we actually were able to do a mental capacity evaluation and uh, find out why he would be unfit from everyone's perspective, from law, political science, history, uh, economics, journalism, social psychology, nuclear science, and climate science. Um, because if you don't have basic mental capacity, you cannot be fit in any other domain. So, uh, we'll next hear from Dr. James Marikangas, a renowned forensic neuropsychiatrist, uh, a co-founder of the American Neuropsychiatric Association, former president of the American Academy of Clinical Psychiatrists, founder of an EEG laboratory and a neurodiagnostic clinic uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, and now clinical professor of psychiatry and behavioral science at George Washington University. He is a research consultant at the National Institute of Mental Health and served on the expert panel that performed a mental capacity evaluation of the president. Uh, Dr. Mayor Kangas. Well, thank you, Bandy. The first thing I want to say is that everyone should buy this book. This is Bandy's book, Trump's Mind, America's Soul. It is a wonderful dissertation on forensic psychiatry as applied to political figures. And had this been read in Germany in the 30s, history could be different. Fortunately, right now we've had an election, which is one advantage that we have here in the US about our system. But now they're trying to overthrow the election. But I'm not here to talk about that. I am a neurologist and a psychiatrist. The psychiatric aspects of President Trump have been discussed many, many times in all the various books. The neurology of it, I've seen recent articles 
mentioning some of the factors which are very scary about him. Simply observing him walk or to sit or to hold a glass of water raise issues about his neurologic condition. His mysterious visit to Walter Reed, which he explained last year as being part of his annual physical, which it clearly wasn't, we had no explanation of what they did or why. The one physical exam that he had from his doctor in New York, he admits that he wrote it himself and that doctor just signed it. The other suspicious things about his health, of course, his bone spurs to get out of the draft was because he had a chiropractor who rented a building from his father, or not a chiropractor, I'm very, very sorry, a podiatrist, a doctor of foot medicine, who wrote that. The physician, the White House physician who wrote up his physical exam was someone who works for President Trump. We can't rely on that. Even his recent visit to Walter Reed for the coronavirus, we never got any real information, any real summaries or lab values about what his condition actually was. We got nothing but what I would call pablum about that. We have his problems at West Point, walking down the ramp, which is suggestive of some kind of difficulty as well. So these things that make a neurologist wonder and our examination of the things about his political uh, statements, his Twitter feeds and all of that and the Mueller investigation allowed us to look at his mental health, which clearly is signs of something quite wrong with him. His constant lying is a major concern. Why does he lie that way? Well, that I refer you to, to uh, Bandy's latest book because there's a great discussion of that in there. But I, I would think that after these visits to Walter Reed, there should have been an assessment by an independent group, that perhaps the panel that Jamie Raskin has suggested to Congress, which no one has voted on, to do a neurologic exam, a physical exam perhaps to do a brain scan, an MRI scan, because it's possible that the president has had some strokes. I mean, it's likely a man his age who has his medical problems and his build, there could be something wrong there. His very simplified speech, people have analyzed his vocabulary and it's gotten smaller and smaller as he grows older. He is after all of an age when a lot of people start to develop dementia. It is said that his father died with dementia. Familial history is a risk factor for having dementia. So these are things that should be investigated. It's my opinion that anyone who is going to hold the keys to the nuclear weapons should be examined. I was in the Navy and I had nuclear weapons in my, in my purview. I've actually witnessed the explosion of a hydrogen bomb in the Pacific. And let me tell you, it's a pretty scary thing. But the people we had working on those weapons were trained and tested and they were not mentally ill. Because if they were, they wouldn't be there. But we have a system where someone can just get voted in with no credentials, no qualifications, and have the ability to wipe out the civilization and the population of the earth simply on a whim. There's no one to stop him if he wants to do that. And we now have a very short time before January 20th, which he can do a great deal of damage. I would urge the Congress to pass the 25th Amendment panel right now, or even impeach the president again right now, although that would stop all other work of the Congress because I think that he's a very dangerous person now, worse than he was before. I think he's deteriorated over the years. I mean, speaking as a neurologist, this is what I would say. And Bandy, I would, I would like your opinion on this. I mean, as a person who does capacity examinations, I think you're in a great position to comment on these things. Bandy, can you unmute? 
Yes, thank you, Dr. Marikangas. That was a very thorough exposition of uh, all that we're concerned about. Uh, I would just add that mental capacity evaluations are not so much to diagnose someone and to treat them as a patient. It's uh, an evaluation that we do for fitness for office. And it's uh, an evaluation we do for the public um, because the, the, the people are the president's employers and these tests are done routinely all the time. Uh, all law enforcement personnel have to go through it before they take their jobs. All military personnel have to go through it before they take their jobs. And as Dr. Mary Kangas was mentioning, those who handle nuclear weapons go through rigorous psychological testing and re have to renew it every year. Uh, so the fact that the person who commands nuclear weapons does not have to undergo any testing is actually very anomalous and unlike any position. Yeah, I, share Professor I share Professor Painter's fear for the future of the human race because it is not a simple thing to set off a bomb. It's not like an ordinary bomb. Nuclear weapons with the countermeasures which come almost automatically from states like China and Russia would do devastation to the entire earth, not just where that bomb is landing. And I should also mention that these factors that are neurological in the uh, brain scans and like don't directly correlate with behavior. They're only things that are seen that help you figure out what is wrong with someone. We know there's something wrong with President Trump. We just don't know from a brain standpoint what that is. A physical examination, brain scans would help us do a diagnosis. But you'll notice I did not present a diagnosis. I said that there is something wrong that you can judge exists, but it needs further evaluation. And that's why we need this panel to evaluate what is going on. Thank you very much, Dr. Mary Kangas. Uh, it seems that attorney Richard Painter has joined us. So uh, Richard, if you can hear, would you like to give your presentation? Richard? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, oh, welcome. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. I was delayed at the hospital with my 92 year old mother who had a hip operation. Uh, and so I was, I just got out of the hospital uh, with her, but I'm pleased to join the group here. And uh, I want to emphasize how critically important it is uh, for us in the next uh, 60 some days, 70 days, whatever it is, uh, to keep a very close eye on President Trump and his psychological condition. I wish the Congress would pass the 25th Amendment panel legislation, but we need to be prepared to move very quickly if Donald Trump uh, decides to move in a destructive direction uh, particularly with the threat of criminal indictment over hanging over his head uh, uh, from the state of New York, possibly other places. I believe he could very well behave irrationally in, in office. And of course, the nuclear weapons are a large part of it. I, I think there are two things he could try to do to precipitate a crisis. One is to start a major war either with Iran or some other country. So our country is in a state of war and thus in a state of emergency. And indeed, if it were a nuclear war, or a war where our country either could be attacked by nuclear weapons or under threat of attack by nuclear weapons, he could justify imposing martial law, uh, which of course could be very dangerous and that he might see that as a way out of the transition. Uh, to President-elect uh, Biden. Uh, the other avenue would be simply domestic to try to incite domestic insurrection and then declare an emergency that way. Uh, but 
you know, I think the latter route probably doesn't give him much by way of an opportunity here. He's not going to get the support of the Republicans in the House and the Senate uh, for refusing to transfer power outside of an extraordinarily dangerous situation. And that's what brings us back to the nuclear weapons and the fact that for the next 68 days or whatever it is, I'm losing track, uh, he could start a war. And that's part of our problem under our War Powers Act. It doesn't work very well if the president can simply start a war, even though the Constitution says it's the Congress that is needed to declare war. But when he controls the military this way, he knows he can start a war until January 20, 2021. And if he starts a war, he becomes the hero protecting America and can pretty much do anything he wants, or so he thinks. He's also being advised by John Yu, professor from Berkeley, the law school at Berkeley, uh, who unfortunately was given tenure. I don't know why. Uh, but he went into the Bush administration and authored the torture memos, and he has a new book out on the so-called unitary executive theory about how the president can do just about anything he wants in office under Article 2 of the Constitution, and even more so when the country is at war. So the problem here is that we have constitutional law scholars, they call themselves scholars, saying that the president's powers are unlimited, particularly if the country's at war. We have the ability of the president to start a war without Congress authorizing it, even though the Constitution says that Congress is supposed to declare war. We've got nuclear weapons, which are obviously are extremely dangerous. And if he starts a fight with a country that might also have nuclear weapons, uh, he could uh, create a situation where we could very quickly be in a national state of emergency, which then expands his powers even more. And on top of that, a president who is psychologically unbalanced for all of the reasons that Fandy and the other experts on this panel have pointed out. And in closing, I just want to emphasize how preposterous it is that people in the psychiatric profession would have as a standard of conduct a rule that says that members of the profession cannot speak out about the grave dangers of someone who may be psychiatrically unbalanced possessing nuclear weapons and the ability to destroy human civilization. And the idea that some professional code of conduct is more important than the duty that we would all have as citizens to point out risks that we perceive to our society, and particularly a risk as grave as a nuclear conflagration caused by a psychologically unbalanced man. The idea that you would have to keep your mouth shut because of some professional code of ethics is really, quite frankly, disgusting, and it's an embarrassment to the psychiatric profession. I understand why people are upset about the very Goldwater race in 1964, but it's time to get over that. And, you know, the psychiatrists ought to have the same freedom of speech that the rest of us do. I can talk about the Constitution and the war powers and this phony unitary executive theory that John Yu, this professor from Berkeley, has been schlepping all over the place. But I cannot opine as a psychiatrist on the mental condition of the president. I can just say, I look at his Twitter feed and think this guy must be nuts. But I need somebody to step in with more professional sophistication and say something. It's your duty to say something. I thank Fandy for doing that. I hope that Yale University, where she's been working, will support her in that. And going forward, that all of us, all of us will be committed uh, to a psychiatric examination, not only of the people who carry the nuclear weapons, the man who carries the football around with the president, I'm sure he has to go in under a psychiatric examination. But how about the president of the United States himself? We can never be exposed to this grave a risk again. And I, I thank Bandy for putting together this program. And, and I hope we can take this very, very seriously 
And I pray that we get through to January 20 without a major disaster. Thank you, Richard. That was really relevant and excellent. Thank you for that summary. Um, now, uh, since we, we uh, just have a little bit of time left, uh, we should go to questions. And so if people who have questions, you can go to the participants icon at the bottom of your screen and click on it. Then you will see at the bottom to your right, the option of raising your hand. When Leonard calls you, uh, please state uh, your name, profession, and whom you would like to address your question to. Great, we'll get our first question from Michael Ross. If you can please unmute your microphone and go ahead and ask your question. Again, Michael Ross. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Hi, I, I'm, I'm sorry to uh, uh, drop out there. Uh, my name is Michael and, and uh, I'm actually a Canadian citizen. I was a US citizen for most of my childhood, but here I am. Um, my question is the curiosity about the fourth uh, article of the 25th amendment as it regards the vice president. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious that the one requirement that we have is that the vice president, as in Mr. Pence, uh, approves the submission of these are this uh, request under the 25th amendment. I'm wondering if possibly you could uh, discuss that. And also, I would like to thank Dr. Lee for, for all her work here. I'm, I'm a fellow Yaley. I, I, I was in the School of Art a long, long time ago, so I have a very strong affinity to you. And also to uh, Steve Hassan and his book, The Cult of Trump, which I would recommend as reading to anyone listening here. Uh, we are in very, very troubled times and uh, I wish us all well. Thank you. Richard, I have a question to you. Vice President? Edelson, is that who you're calling on? Maybe he had to go. Uh, yeah. Let's state since I, yes. Yeah, R Richard is still here. So hopefully, um, oh, if okay. Richard could un unmute and it um, looks like you're directing the, the question to him. Well, I can, I can just, um, relay some uh, discussions I've had actually with the author of the 25th Amendment. I had the honor of uh, speaking at the same conference at the 50th anniversary of the 25th Amendment. I was the only medical professional there. And I did ask that question about the vice president. Oh, Richard, you're back. Yes. Yeah, I'm back. Um, I had to unmute myself. I but I think your, your insights are probably better than mine on this, Mandy. But the problem is that Congress is not, does have the power in the 25th Amendment to design a panel to have a way uh, to uh, have professionals determine if the president is incapable. And Congress can do that, as suggested in the article I wrote with Nora Meisen uh, for your, your book, on the dangerous case of Donald Trump. The problem is Congress hasn't done it, so we're stuck with the default rule, which really means the vice president needs to trigger this with the cabinet. And I doubt that Congress will get its act together and actually pass the law to set up the panel within the next 60, 70 days. So we may be stuck with the vice president, the system where the vice president and the majority of the cabinet decide the president is not capable of carrying forth his duties and then Congress votes. Yes, that seems to be a common 
barrier that's thought of. But when I spoke with the author of the 25th Amendment, John Farrick, uh, he actually said that the vice president, rather than leading uh, the charge, would actually come last. In other words, uh, the data were important to him also. So any data that medical professionals can provide, if they were to be taken up by the cabinet or other body, and these were to lean on, one of these, not both, one of these would, to, would lean on the vice president, then he would agree. So that I thought was interesting. Yes, if he'd agree, if we get the vice president on board, I think we're in good shape. Uh, and, you know, honestly, if, if Donald Trump's going to destroy human civilization with a nuclear weapon, I think that that Vice President Pence would probably do this. But the problem is that Trump could do something like start a war with a conventional attack or something that doesn't quite meet the completely crazy level, but then it escalates because, uh, you know, the person running the other country is crazy. I mean, I, I've got to say, Iran doesn't instill a lot of confidence in me either. The leadership in Iran. So he could go pick a fight with a country where you also have some crazies and, you know, it gets out of control. And then the, what What can Mike Pence do? That's the problem. Um, we really need to have this law passed. We have the panel empowered and paneled by the House of Representatives and the Senate rather than just rely on the vice president and the cabinet. Yes, thank you, Richard. We have uh, several more questions, so uh, I'll ask that you keep them short, and uh, we'll try to keep our answers short. Yes, next great. Question. Our next question will come from Richard Edelson. Please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, to everybody. This is most interesting. I'm Richard Edelson. I'm a clinical psychologist and also a past reform rabbi, still a reform rabbi, a former Navy chaplain and hospital chaplain. And uh, my question is about how do we get a seat at the table with um, the people that are the decision makers in Washington, such as the transition of, uh, of President-elect Biden's transition, where we can have his ear and have the ear of other important uh, people who could put our opinions into implementation. Thank you. And whoever wants to answer it. That's a very start. difficult. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's, yeah. Yes. Yeah, let's talk. The the uh, I'm, I'm, in the I'm in the district of Jamie Raskin. I, he's my representative, and I'm certainly going to going to get in touch with him as soon as I can. I, I know that Bandy has been in touch with him, but we need we need more than the two of us to get in touch with our congressman. We have to have everybody. Everybody watching this uh, presentation should be calling their congressman right away. That, that's my opinion. Jamie Raskin has been quite sensitive in having psychiatrists and medical doctors on the commission he has in mind. But our system is actually anomalous in that we have to wait till politicians have the awareness and invite us. There's no other avenue for us to get a seat at the table. And I personally feel that that's something that needs to change. It's not done that way in most countries. Uh, in many places, they have independent advisory boards where uh, experts can give independent input. Richard? I'd agree you... with that. I'd agree with that. And Ra Jamie Raskin is on top of this more than anybody else that I've talked to in Congress. Uh, and uh, the problem is we can't get the rest of them to pay attention. I, al I also feel strongly, though, we ought to focus not just on the 25th Amendment, but we got to get the War Powers Act situation under control. You, you can't, you can't ha uh, have one man or woman have that uh, power to start a war without other people being involved in the decision-making process, not, not in the nuclear age. Uh, the founders intended for Congress to declare war. So even 200 and some years ago, they didn't want one person to be able to make that decision. And yet de facto, that's where we are. We've got to fix that. We've got to get a War Powers Act that actually adheres to the Constitution uh, because I, I, I don't want to rely just on the psychiatric evaluation and the panel and so forth. 
uh, I'm just not sure any one person ought to be able to pull the trigger on the nukes that way. Yes, thank you. Uh, let's go to the next question. Right, our next question comes from the Zoom user with the initials LM. Please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Hi, my name is Lily. Thank you, everyone. In terms of uh, getting our voices heard, I'm wondering how Speaker Pelosi has been tracking this and have do we have options to kind of align and go through her? I'm happy to call and write, but is I wonder what um, she's been, where she's standing with this process. Thank you. Uh, if I may, well, she has introduced the new legislation together with Jamie Raskin, uh, but in terms of her office reaching out to us, that hasn't happened yet. We, of course, at one point uh, petitioned her with 800, over 800 signatures, asking her to consult with us during the impeachment proceedings, uh, but we've not heard back. Thank you very much. Shall we go to the next question? Okay. A quick time check. It's about three minutes to the top of the hour. It looks like about five or six questions in the queue. So um, just keep, keep rolling with them. Yes. Great, our next question will come from um, Susan. Susan Jones. We keep underestimating, you know, the Republican uh, enablers. Richard Painter mentioned John Yu uh, and Pence. Our, um, Jamie Raskin mentioned Lindsey Graham. And, you know, just the other day, John Cornyn said, you know, made some bizarre statement about Puerto Rico not counting the votes. Um, I attended a rally in Durham, North Carolina today, um, where there were counter protesters uh, who are just really off the wall. So I know this question has been asked so many times, but. One, how could we have left such a gaping hole? And we as a society are really struggling and weary and tired, and this isn't gonna end if and when Trump leaves. What more can we do to help people, our friends and colleagues and neighbors cope? Thank you. Um, would anyone like to answer that, Dr. Mary Kangas? I'm happy to answer it, it's Richard. Okay, Richard. Well, we need to hold people accountable who engage in illegal conduct. And, you know, or they're just gonna come back again. And this is what happened with John Yu. He authored those torture memos that were clearly authorizing criminal conduct. He was doing that from the Justice Department. And there was basically, there was no investigation other than the professional responsibility division of the Justice Department, which did a whitewash, no criminal prosecution. And now he's back. And we can't make that mistake again. And the President Obama made that mistake. He was urged by a number of people, including my co author, a number of papers, Professor Claire Finkelstein at the University of Pennsylvania. She wrote some papers back in 2010 saying, hey, look, we've got to hold these people accountable who got us into the torture situation and putting out torture memos. And John Yu was at the top of the list. Uh, and nobody did anything about it. He kept his tenure at Berkeley. He's teaching students this nonsense. And now he's got this book on unitary executive power that's on Donald Trump's desk, basically saying the president can do anything he wants. And he can do even more if he goes out and declares a war or starts a war. Uh, and so I get back to why didn't we hold you accountable for what he did in the Bush years? Were we too timid, too scared? Are we gonna make that mistake this time or take the advice that Professor Finkelstein gave us in 2010 about the torture memos? And this time at least, can we appoint a special prosecutor and hold the people accountable who at least, who violated the law under the Trump administration? 
or they all get a pass so they can come back in four years or eight years with somebody else they put in the White House who may or may not be psycho uh, psychologically balanced. Yes, and that's psychologically therapeutic as well, that we set limits and contain individuals who cannot set limits for themselves. And uh, that sets norms and standards and helps uh, the entire culture around them. Uh, shall we go to the next question? Great, our next question will come from Anne. You can please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Hi. My can you guys hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I live in Chicago, which you know is the third biggest city. So Chicago would be right up there with New York and DC if Trump creates a nuclear war and we're counterattacked. And I'm not joking, but do you think it would, I'm asking Dr. Lee, do you think it would be good for our own safety to relocate temporarily to a really small town like move to North Dakota or Canada for the next two months. I mean, because Chicago is right up there and I've been scared for four years since he provoked that Kim guy in North Korea. I actually ordered extra food and supplies and put it in my car and people thought I was silly or crazy, but I mean, he's in a narcissistic rage now and he could do anything. So what can we do for our own safety, if anything? Yes, I absolutely. Can I answer? Uh, yes, please. Having worked with nuclear weapons and having witnessed the nuclear explosion, let me say that moving from Chicago to anywhere on the continent, you would not be safe. The countermeasures from other countries, not only are there a thousand weapons aimed at us right now to every city in America, but the radiation, the blast, and the fallout would hit all of us. Nobody is safe. If they drop a nuclear bomb on Seattle, people in Washington DC will feel the effects of that. So you're not going to be safe moving. I would say stay in Chicago and, and work for peace. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're, we're just gonna spend a couple more minutes. So maybe we could get uh, about three questions in a row and then try to answer if possible. Great. Our next and please question. Please keep them short. Great. Our next question will come from Laura. If you can please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I guess I had a question. If um, the Twenty Fifth Amendment is invoked and it is successful, if um, it seems like the Vice President would take over, and I just had a question: What if the Vice President uh, shares the same pathology as the President? What happens then? Or is there some kind of a process? Uh, that would prevent uh, that from happening or like what would be the third option um, if the vice president shares again the same kind of pathology as the president? That's my question. Thank you. Next question. Great. Our next question will come from Riva. If you can please unmute your microphone and go ahead. So my question, for the record, I don't expect Pence or the cabinet to go against Trump. And I expect Congress as a whole, not individual members, will continue to be lily delivered and escape responsibility for as long as possible. So some of the things you're saying are actually discouraging since that is not what, how I perceive the situation. Um, my question is the group. How do we structure the group so that it doesn't have, that it has power enough to come forth and make a difference and be heard. But so it isn't like another Federalist Society or outside group that has too much power. Okay, thank you. Next question, please. Great. And then the next one um, can uh, come from Marion. Yes, hi, it's Marion Douglas Ungaro in Washington, DC. Um, I'm a journalist and international human rights consultant working, having worked in Bosnia, Croatia, Haiti and elsewhere. And I'm actually asking about the current situation 
with the coronavirus because this is going to be worse than what we've already been through. The physicians and uh, medical people are telling us that they are exhausted. The system is collapsing. That's my question, not nuclear weapons, but the tens of thousands of people who could die in the next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see still a lot of questions, but we're out of time. So I'm just going to ask first, Richard, would you like to answer any of those questions or to give your last word? Yeah, um, I, I, I believe this is a very dangerous situation for President Trump right now, and we need to focus on it uh, and get Congress to focus on it. One other possibility that I may raise with Jamie Raskin and others, and I don't know if it would work, but that the majority of the House authorized the Speaker to bring any and all emergency actions required before the United States Supreme Court for injunctions against the president using his Article II powers in ways that contravene the Constitution, including the, uh, the right of Congress to declare war, and that they, basically the speaker be given a blank check by the House to bring such actions to the court the speaker be in communication with the court between now and January 20, uh, able to petition for emergency relief. And I know we're not dealing with a very sympathetic court, but if we were in a situation where there were significant risks of the destruction of human civilization, I believe that the Roberts court might at least enter some injunctions. I don't know that they would take all of the president's Article II powers away uh, because the court is not empowered to enforce the 25th Amendment, but there might very well be some, some avenue of relief there uh, to at least enjoin certain actions of the president. So that's one avenue that I am going to urge Jamie Raskin to be explored, that, that such basically a proxy be given to the speaker to bring such a, 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 a action uh, for injunctive relief to the United States Supreme Court in an emergency situation. And then at least we'd have one group of nine decision makers who would have an opportunity to derail uh, a catastrophe. Whether or not they would or not, I would not want to speculate. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, Dr. Marikangas, would you like to give your last word? Well, the coronavirus is, uh, it is a catastrophe already. The coronavirus is a catastrophe. And if you look at countries like Taiwan, where they've had very few cases because they have a public health system that's excellent. They had an epidemiologist who is the vice president of the country. They immediately have everyone wearing masks and doing all those things. I hold President Trump guilty of manslaughter for at least 250,000 people and that he should be held accountable. And I think that the mistake we have made is not holding politicians accountable. We don't hold prosecutors accountable for sending people to death who happen to be innocent. We have to start as Professor Painter says, holding these politicians accountable. We should not be afraid to prosecute the people who leave office who were guilty of these crimes against humanity. Thank you very much. And thank you so much again, Dr. Mary Kangas. Um, so uh, if I may just briefly go over the questions as to the vice president, if he shares the same pathology, well, I have recommended that fitness for duty exams be uh, required uh, at least um, uh, uh, suggested strongly to all presidential and vice presidential candidates. But whenever I mention this, the people ask about Congress members as well. So that may be a good idea. Uh, as for our group, um, we have, uh, we recently published over 300 pages of letters, petitions, and conference transcripts that list all our activities over the last four years. And so let that be a historic record as to how hard 
mental health professionals have tried and have had to try with very little effect. This has to change. Um, as to the coronavirus situation, well, dangers regarding nuclear weapons also translates to dangers with geopolitical wars, uh, to civil war, to stoking of uh, violence, to homicides, suicides, as well as mismanaging a deadly pandemic. So uh, violence cuts all across the board and uh, it all originates in the same place, uh, at least in the immediate. That's why uh, removing dangers from the executive office is so important. And uh, so with that, um, those answers that we couldn't uh, uh, get to, please feel free to put them in the chat because we collect uh, uh, the chat um, information and we'll try to answer them on our website. You can visit our website at worldmhc.org or dangerouscase.org. Uh, also, um, our prescription for survival is relevant, prescriptionforsurvival.org, uh, which shows that our statement that we do not dictate how the president should be removed, but we do say from a public health perspective that he must be removed. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh, good night. Thank you so much, Mandy. Good night. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Thank you, Bandy. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lee and everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee and everyone who spoke. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Lee. You're great. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Dr. You, Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Bandy. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Great. Thank you again, everyone, for your participation. We'll be wrapping this up in a few seconds. Obrigado.